Uh oh. <clears throat> Leave meeting. There we go. Oh no, got it. There we go. That was neat. Oh, speaking of maritime museums, Mystic Seaport uh, decided after 40 some years of having the Sea Music Festival to get rid of it. The one year shanties actually got to be viral on the internet. Oh, yeah. Right. So, Time is everything. Yeah. But the Connecticut um, Connecticut River Museum and a couple other ones, are, like in Essex, um, have taken it on. And the, it's going to be basically the same people who do it. I was just on a Zoom concert with them. There were 130 people on it. It was pretty neat. Totally um, neat. Yeah, you were there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh. And singers from all over the world. And it was uh, it was so neat to see. A lot of those people, I got to play at Mystic, I think, four or five times, and um, it was always, it was always brilliant. It was great. That's the first time I've seen that. I didn't even know about that until it showed up on my uh, uh, Facebook. Oh, yeah. They brought in, you know, Stan Hugel was there just about every year. He he was alive, oh, yeah. and... Um, uh, the Baruli Whalers from the Caribbean, um, singers yeah. from all over Europe. Uh, a lot of the people we had our maritime festival were also from Mystic or we knew because of Muse of Mystic. It was very very cool. I see Clark. Hey Clark, how are you? Hey, I'm good. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. Everybody uh, staying warm and dry. Uh, dry. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, I invited people to uh, break out their worst or best rum. Some people have already started. <laughs> Very good. It's just about time to start, but we still have some people rolling in. So I All think right. we, we could probably start with just a few general announcements, get you up uh, for those folks that have just joined us recently here. We're talking a little bit about the museum. Uh, we've got some great new exhibits. If you haven't been down there lately, the whole lobby area has been redone and some of the old exhibits have been freshened up a bit. Uh, a lot of great videos worked in with them. Please stop by and check out what we've got going. And we still have a lot of new improvements coming for the exhibits as well. This year we'll be filling out the south side with some great new additions and uh, a lot, a lot of reasons to come back and see the museum again. And we're definitely looking forward to when we can have these programs in person again, too. So um, as soon as we can with that, we're going to love seeing all you folks in person. But until then, really glad that you're joining us online. Um, for those of you who are already members, thank you so much for your support and membership. We love having you part of everything. Um, if it's just not right for you to join yet, if if you could make a small donation for tonight's program, if you could give us five bucks, we'd really appreciate it. If not, we're still glad you're here and we sure hope you come back. Uh, we'll be trying to be much better this year about having these programs every month. We got some really good ones lined up coming up on the Great Lakes Palace steamers and Life Saving Service. So we're gonna have great programs. So keep an eye on the museum and what's going on with it. Um, Jerry, would you, Make an announcement about Don? Uh, yes. Um, some of you know that Don uh, uh, passed away not too long ago. And, uh, and he, he spent a lot of time uh, at the Maritime Museum. He was our curator. He was our, our accountant and our finance. And he ran his uh, Captain's Emporium out of the store. Um, but of course, what he really was, was a, uh, a sailor. And there, there is Don, I hope you can see it, uh, in his typical pose. Uh, I ran across Don in, in a whole variety of contexts. Uh, I worked with him on the Judd Goldman program uh, for about 34 years. And we worked on the junior program there. Uh, Don, of course, was an old goat. He had done 56 max. I'm only done 42, so I'm still working at it. Um, so we, we, we cross tax there. Uh, 
Don was a, a, a race officer and a, a, a U.S. sailing judge, and he and I did a lot of U.S. sailing judges together. Um, so I just want to say, um, in all these different contexts, I really missed Don, and um, he was a uh, he made a huge contribution to the sailing community and to the maritime community, and um, in all these different groups and groups that I had nothing to do with, like the Vietnam War. Uh, uh, he had, or maybe it may have the wrong war anyhow, but in, in the spirit of Don, we, we just move forward with, with the facts as we have them. So I, um, I missed Don and uh, uh, just like to share my thoughts with you. Thank you, Jerry. We, and we're grateful to have had Don as part of the museum and the sailing community. And he was a Korean War vet. <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, I, I, I know I, I, I know I blew it. So that's okay. Yeah, he's just an all around fascinating guy. I and mean, there's so many things that you just never knew about Don. Find out that he lived on Grant Woods art, artist colony growing up and that oh. he, was, he was a real pioneer in the TV industry. He was a really early on producer and director and just amazing things that you'd never guess. Kind of like our guest speaker tonight. You just have no idea what all Tom Castle's involved with. Um, I mean, he's a pretty amazing guy. I mean, his connection with the Chicago Maritime Museum goes back to the beginning in the 1980s. He served on the board for many years. He was the co-founder of the extremely successful Chicago Maritime Festival. And Tom's, he's just an all-around fascinating guy. He's a ship captain, a singer, a songwriter, recording artist, professional actor, which includes Later, being the narrator of the Emmy-nominated Bicentennial Battle of Lake Erie. Just Tom, wait, Merle. Jesus. Okay, if everybody could mute, it'd be great. Um, Tom's been one of the most I active. Can't get the audio going here. Tom's been one of the act, most active and ardent supporters of the museum, as well as being a frequent performer at all our museum events over the years. Now, be sure to go to tomcastle.com where you can find links <sighs> to his music and find out more about his other activities including a new project that he's producing and hosting the podcast Sullivan Stories. Okay, do you want to come stories, on? It features the stories of professional crew of the schooner Dennis Sullivan. Now this summer, Tom will be hosting and performing at tall ships vessels across the Great Lakes from two harbors in Detroit to Cleveland and Erie. So tonight we're all in for a musical and educational treat. Please join me in welcoming our great friend, Tom Castle. Uh... But everybody, if I please ever mute themselves. The ships again to earn my spots and cakes. On up to sail in a deep sea craft. It's me for the inland lakes. It's me for the inland lakes, me boys. Me for the inland lakes. On up to sail in a deep sea craft. It's me for the inland lakes. You get a berth that's really a berth. Jaw the skipper takes. No oh, end, I swear it's a wonderful life. Here on the rolling lakes. Here on the rolling lakes, me boys. Here on the rolling lakes. It's a wonderful life, I swear to you. Here on the rolling lakes. The runs are short and the vessels are sound. And real men are the mates. There many can handle a ship. It's me for the open lakes. It's me for the open lakes, me boys. Me for the open lakes. The men are men that can handle the ship. It's me for the olden lakes. Now gales may blow and the seas run high. The leaves for the country jakes. But our quarters are warm and the grub is good. Here on the rolling lakes. It's me for the rolling lakes, me boys. It's me for the rolling lakes. Our quarters are warm and the grub is good. Here on the rolling lakes. dollars a day they often pay much better than ocean crates and when the season's done all winter you bum here on the inland lakes hey here on the inland lakes me boys here on the inland lakes the wisen's done all winter you bum here on the inland lakes there we go i hope the sound's balanced and all that kind of thing that is a song I got, um, which I haven't done in a very, very long time, but I dug it out for tonight because it's from the Ivan Henry Walton collection. And that's how I got into all this sailing and singing stuff. 
And as Jim said, I've been involved in the Maritime Museum, Maritime Society since the 1980s. That's around the same time I started sailing and started sailing aboard the schooner Charlotte Ann in uh, 1985, 1986. And uh, at that time, um, my old partner Chris and I were singing in Irish pubs. And we were singing a lot of nautical tunes. So we figured if there were nautical tunes from England and Ireland and Scotland, were there tunes from the Great Lakes? So we were at um, a meeting, a very, very early meeting. I think it was at Phil Elms Real Estate um, Office in uh, Hyde Park. And we met a fella named Ted Karamansky. And Ted, I dug out a couple books tonight. This is one of the books that changed my life. And Ted said, um, you know, there's this whole collection of Great Lakes music at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor um, from the Ivan Walton, um, uh, Ivan Henry Walton collection. He said, I've never been able to go over there, but if you guys are interested, why don't you go over there? So we went there and spent a couple of days there listening to the old recordings of the sailors who were sailing. Well, basically, Walton was this guy from about 1938 to, to World War II who dragged a record-cutting machine all over the Great Lakes. And he was interviewing old sailors. So he would go to nursing homes and community centers, and he would talk to some of these guys who were 70s, 80s, 90s, back in 1939 which meant that they were the people that were crewing these ships back in the heyday of sail. So a lot of this stuff comes directly from the mouths of the sailors, including a bit of that last song I just sang. Um, it was a, a really interesting thing because at that time we decided we would create a career for ourselves that was singing and sailing for a living. And that's what I've been doing ever since. I didn't know until I got to be this old how bad the retirement plan was, but um, but the perks have been absolutely phenomenal. I've uh, been able to travel around the world and, and do music of the Great Lakes, which is kind of neat. Oh, also a footnote. We were talking, uh, we had just done this wonderful fundraiser at the museum and talking about the diverse maritime uh, you know, heritage of Chicago. And I mentioned this book, but I found it tonight. And this is by um, uh, Jared Altoff, who, um, who I met in Putin Bay doing a documentary about the Battle of Lake Erie. And it's called Amongst My Best Friends, African Americans and the War of 1812, which is a really, really interesting um, study about what life was like back in those days. So back in the 1980s ended up on board the schooner charlotte Ann. we had chartered the boat out to do the very first great lakes whale watch which is beyond the scope of this talk but we'll do that some other time but he got really really interested in the history of it and one of the things that ted talked about and a couple other people down at the maritime society um was sea history magazine and in the 19, one of the 1988 issues, there is a, an article by Theodore Charney, who I believe was also a Tribune writer. Maybe you could confirm that. I'm pretty sure. But he was talking about Chicago back in the day. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I grew up in Chicago. I had no idea any of this tall ship history existed ever because nobody ever talked about it. Not in school, not at libraries, not anywhere. And um, so a couple of things from Charney's article, which I always love to point out to people not familiar with Chicago or the Great Lakes, is that during the 1880s, over 20,000 ship clearances a year were recorded. And in 1892 alone, Chicago shipping was surpassed only by London, Hamburg, and New York. So you think about the great port towns, you think about Boston, you think about San Francisco, Los Angeles, not even close to Chicago. Uh, there were approximately 1,800 sailing ships on the Great Lakes, and 20% of the entire Great Lakes commercial fleet wintered on the Chicago River. So when you look at some of those photographs, 
of that of that forest of mast it was really really you know it was it was a totally different town and it looked like you were probably in boston harbor um the chicago river was a traffic the volume is down there no. janet you gotta mute yourself <laughs> There we go. The Chicago River was an absolute nightmare with 35 pivot bridges in operation in the 1870s, 1,200 openings a day, and well over 100 fights between bridge tenders and tugboat pilots each year. Uh, ashore, um, the insurance would typically run out on the last day of November, but a lot of people took a risk at uh, running into the winter. And that's where we get stories like the Christmas tree ship and other uh, shipwrecks. Also, sailors didn't necessarily get the best reputation. And uh, an editorial in the Interocean warned one winter there'd be two or three thousand idle sailors in Chicago. And there would be many quote unquote desperados among them who would turn to river piracy and worse. So many sailors looking for a winter job would take the low paying but relatively easy work of shipkeeper. Other words took off for work in the lumber camps, sailed in warmer latitudes, or took landsmen's jobs ashore. And uh, that's one of the things that I found in looking into this history um, is that in the 1880s, if it got to be winter, you would typically put the, you know, put the boat away for the winter. And it wouldn't be all that unusual to find yourself 50 60 feet up in the rig with a bucket of tar and a brush slushing down the standing rigging and waiting for your mates down below to put everything else away and some of your mates might be as charney said you might be going to uh, uh, trying to find a job in town or go south or if you can try to take the entire winter off and in one of my very, very favorite books, probably the best thing I've ever seen on life aboard Great Lakes ships is a, um, is a dissertation uh, by Jay Martin that is Sailing the Freshwater Seas, A Social History of Life Aboard the Commercial Sailing Vessels of the United States and Canada on the Great Lakes. And uh, I think this is back from 1995. It's uh, a little hard to see there, but it is uh, it's a published thesis um, that is just absolutely fascinating. And one character that I hope to do some kind of piece on someday was a guy named Lars Stelstadt, who, um, who was a Great Lakes sailor, took his entire winter off in Chicago to enjoy his three favorite pastimes, which were um, drinking, uh, painting, and hypnotism. So... I always dedicate any kind of song about being around in the wintertime in Chicago to Lars Stelstein. Mm. So in, in the 1980s, I found myself up in the rig with a bucket of tar, thinking things had not changed that much. And that's where this song comes from. And uh, it's been recorded by uh, Lee Murdoch and a group in England and a group in the Netherlands. And it's called Cold Winds. There we go. Across the harbor, cold winds on the inland sea. Same winds that called our fathers, cold winds are calling me. Ice forms on deck and whiskers, light a fire and stay below. Shut up tight. The winds all whisper, pass the bottle, it's time to go. Cold winds blow across the harbor, cold winds on the inland sea. Same winds that call our fathers, cold winds are calling me, rise up. Rise on and dark the edges, 
Mind your hands, the correct answer. Check the lines on your way inland. It's time to get a job ashore. Cold winds blow across the harbor. Cold winds on the inland sea. Same wind that call our fathers. Cold winds are calling me. Spray and full moon autumns, wood and water, frost and stone. Early snows mean early winters. Taste each season as it goes. Cold winds blow across the harbor. Cold winds, honey and lancy. Same winds that call our fathers, cold winds are calling me. One of the things I put in the um, in the intro for this is um, oh, what was it? It was like uh, uh, sources from this collection and that collection, all the way to Moby Dick and uh, or at least Melville. And um, it's uh, I think it was there was a Great Lakes magazine that was published for a while, and they they printed this. <clears throat> I must be honest and say I'm a little bit ashamed as a sailor who has never read the entire book of Moby Dick I, it's always defeated me every time I've tried um, but um, this is um, basically what they talk about in Moby Dick um, about the Great Lakes as one of them is a, a Great Lakes sailor for in their interflowing aggregate those grand freshwater seas of ours Erie and Ontario and Huron and Superior and Michigan possess an ocean-like expansiveness with many of the ocean's noblest traits, with many of its rim varieties of races and climes. They contain round archipelagos of romantic isles, even as the Polynesian waters do. They're shored by two great contrasting nations as the Atlantic. They're frowned upon by batteries and by the goat-like craggy guns of lofty Mackinac. They've heard the fleet thunderings of naval vic victories <sighs> at intervals. They yield their beaches to wild barbarians. For leagues and leagues are flanked by ancient un unentered forests where the gaunt woods harboring wild Afric beasts of prey and silken creatures whose exported furs give robes to the Tartars and emperors. They mirror the paved capitals of Buffalo and Cleveland, as well as Winnebago villages. They float alike the full-rigged merchant ship, the armed cruiser of state, the steamer, and the beach canoe. They are swept by Borean and dismasting blasts as direful as any that lash the salted wave. And they know what shipwrecks are. For out of sight of land, however inland, they've drowned many a midnight ship with all its shrieking, with all its shrieking crew. And it's, uh, describing a steel kit, I think in chapter 54, talks about that. And there are lots and lots of different shipwreck ballads. Um, there's, of course, the Edmund Fitzgerald, which everybody knows. But that's pretty much modern. As I was looking through a whole bunch of different shipwreck things, 
I was also... I was also playing at one of the first tall ship festivals in Erie, Pennsylvania in the 90s. And in their program, they had a legend about the black dog of Lake Erie. Um, Lake Erie is really weird. If you talk to Great Lakes sailors on the Great Lakes in, Great, in uh, Erie, you'll see that um, they have a different mindset. If you go um, like aboard the Brig Niagara, uh, in Erie and you talk to the sailors there and they talk about weather and they said well you know what Lake Erie is literally so shallow that if the Niagara sank to the bottom of Lake Erie the crew could just climb up in the rigging and stay absolutely dry it's like shaking up a bucket of water shallow water and uh, watching that wave action go absolutely crazy so this is a um, a ballad um, I wrote based on a couple of stories that were traditional that were found in different collections. And it talks about the Black Dog of Lake Erie. It was a harbinger of doom. And if you saw the Black Dog of Lake Erie, uh, odds were you weren't coming home again. Which, of course, begs the question, if everybody who saw the Black Dog of Lake Erie died, then where did we get the story from? But... This is definitely one of those stories. This comes from an eerie source and from the Walton Collection as well. Oh, the water be calm and the wind it be fair. Don't think it's a safe time to sail. For the storm waits and whispers a wolf in its lair. And a hound will howl in the gale. A beast will howl in the gale. We were down, down on Erie, the moon lit our way Like a leaf in the wind we were sent Bristle back head to tail, climbed over the rail And back to the darkness it went Back to the darkness it went I thought I was mad, for none of them had Seen it aboard or ashore It caused such a fright on the Jenkins at night I told them it happened before Warned them of times gone before It was off Fort Colbert in Lake 62 Aboard the old Mary Jane They all saw him well A black hound from hell They've never been seen again Not a soul has been seen again They threw me shore that they listened no more I warned them from moonlight till dawn From Towbridge to Towbridge I followed and called But my mates and the Jenkins are gone the mates and the Jenkins are gone I've seen the black dog with his eyes made of fire I've heard him tread soft in the night It's not what you think, nor the sun, nor the drink I'm cursed because I was right Learn to regret my cruel side Learn to regret my cruel side We go. Thank you. You know, I think I think I might have skipped when we we're doing this is life aboard Great Lake ships uh, was a little bit different than life aboard ships at on salt water. Um, in fact, uh, the Great Lakes were called a sailor's paradise, and um, it was in J. Martin's uh, either dissertation or thesis. I don't remember. Um, but in that book I, I've held up, is that talks about a, an Englishman named William Holm, H-U-L-M-E. And in early, 19, in early 1860, he was sailing off the coast of Australia on a full rig ship called the Belle of the West, sailing from Melbourne to Boston by way of Hong Kong and Manila. Sometime during that voyage, Holmes struck up a conversation with another sailor who had been on the lakes. 
And he started to describe this whole sailor's paradise thing. And it was a place where you didn't have to ration food because the distances between ports were relatively short. You didn't have to ration water ever because the water you were sailing on was fresh water. And the thing that, that uh, surprised him most was that the captain, the officers, and the crew all sat at the same table. And he said, wow, what's next? <laughs> so he got to, uh, got to Boston, jumped on a train, got to Buffalo, and spent the rest of his life as a Great Lakes sailor. And um, I'm still trying to find that diary, but it's, uh, it's definitely out there. Part of J. Martin sailing the freshwater seas. So it was definitely a sailor's paradise. If you fast forward into the 20th century and even a little into the 21st century, you'll find things haven't changed that much either. Though the ships now are, there are still tall ships, obviously, but they're, they're not merchant ships for the most part. They're mostly for tourists or sail training or environmental education or a combination of all those missions. Um, I was able to be lucky enough to sail with Pete Seeger on the Clearwater back in the 90s. And the Clearwater program was brought into the Great Lakes by the Inland Seas Education Association up in Traverse City. And then the Dennis Sullivan in Milwaukee also does that same program. They were trained by uh, the guys in Inland Seas. So that whole tradition that started on the Hudson River in the 60s is continuing into the 21st century with some of the vessels in the Great Lakes. But back in the day, um, they were obviously commercial ships and they carried all kinds of different cargo, um, grain and iron ore and lumber. And uh, this is uh, a song I've done aboard the schooner Inland Seas and Oh, a whole bunch of different different ships and different programs because it's like the one-stop shop for um, for maritime history on the Great Lakes. It talks about the voyage of a ship called the Bigler, and the Bigler was a Great Lakes scow. And a scow is basically like a, a cigar box with a couple masts sticking out of it. And they were very, very cheap to build. And uh, they could get into a whole bunch of undeveloped ports because a lot of the Great Lakes ports weren't anywhere near developed as the, as the coastal ones were. So this is a tune here. And if you listen closely to the words, you could find out what point of sale they were on, where they were traveling, how much money they made in a day, and what it was like for the typical working sailor in those days. Oh, I'm also going to say jump up in your juber jew. And um, as sailors usually slur their words, so starboard is starboard. The, um, uh, the main top mast is the main tops, topmast. And the foresail is the foresail. And the forecastle is the forecastle. Um, juber jew is just the opposite. It's the jib boom, which they lengthened into the word juber jew. Though, if you go back to old minstrel shows, they also talk about uh, Juba dance, Juba sing, Juba do the chicken wing. So, it's in there somewhere. Come on, me boys, and listen on a song I'll sing to you. It's all about the Bigler and our jolly crew. In Milwaukee last October, I chanced to get a sight. The schooner called the Bigler, belonging to Detroit. It was on a Sunday morning, about the hour at ten. The Robert Emmett towed us into two Lake Michigan. We set sail where she left us, in the middle of the fleet. The wind me from the southward, oh, we had to give her sheet. But the wind came ahead before we reached the Manitou's. Three dollars and a half a day suited the Bigler's crew. From there into the beavers, we steered her full and by. We kept her to the wind, me boys, as close as she would lie. Let's watch her, catch her, jump up into jibber too. Give her sheet and let her slide, the boys will put her through. You ought to see us howling as the winds are blowing free. A passage down the buffalo from Milwaukee. We 
mates Gilligilly and Wobbleshanks the entrance to the straits. We might have caught the fleet had they hove to the weight. For we drove them all before us, the prettiest you ever saw. Out to do like here on through the straits of Maginaw. And as a watcher chump, catch up in her chipper chew. Give her sheet and let her slide, the boys will push her through. Yard to see us howling as the winds are blowing free. A passage down the buffalo to Milwaukee. Safely landed at Buffalo Creek at last. And under Riggs Elevator, the bigler she's made fast. And in some longer beer saloon, we'll let the bottle pass. We're all jolly shipmates, we'll take a social glass. And it's watch her, catch her, jump up in a jibber chew. Give her sheet and let her slide, the boys will push her through. Go on to see us howling as the winds are blowing free. A passage down the buffalo from Milwaukee. And it's watch her, catch her, jump up in her jibber chew. Give her sheet and let her slide, the boys will push her through. Go on to see us howling as the winds are blowing free. On a passage down the buffalo from Milwaukee. Come on, me boys, and listen, and a song I'll sing to you. Oh, thank you. That song has a whole bunch of stories in it. Uh, it talks about uh, $3 and a half a day to suit the Bigler's crew. And um, if you go back and look up some of, the, uh, some of the tables of what people were making at the time, uh, that was about the same as a... Maybe a journeyman carpenter would be making or somebody working at a really ritzy store in Chicago or in Buffalo. And uh, it also talks about, I think, I've never been much of a racing sailor. I've done it a little bit. Um, but I think the statement in the last, in the one verse in the song is pretty, pretty amazing. It's got, I think it's the definition of racing sailor chutzpah. Uh, because it says, we might had caught the fleet had they hove to to wait. So we could have caught up with them if they just stopped and waited for us. And then the next line is, we drove them all before us, the prettiest you ever saw. So if you've ever been in a, dead last in a race, it's not that you're dead last. It's that you are driving everyone else before you. I think... It's one of my favorite parts, Maritime Moxie. And uh, scow schooners were not, of course, the prettiest of all. There is a wreck just off of um, uh, South Haven, Michigan, um, where I was captaining a, a boat called Friends Goodwill for a couple of seasons. And, um, and they created this really beautiful boat called Friends Goodwill, which is a War of 1812 replica. But... I kind of wish they had made a scow because you could basically dive on the scow that's off the beach and then go for a sail on a replica of the same scow. It would have been a really interesting experience. Scows were really big in San Francisco. You'll see a lot of pictures of them there um, in different ports all around the country, but especially San Francisco and the Great Lakes. This, one of the surprises of my life was... Um, doing a tour of, of folk clubs in New Zealand and uh, ended up going to uh, the National Maritime Museum in Auckland uh, to do a sort of a lecture concert like this. And um, I had read about, um, about Auckland in Maritime Life and Traditions. I know, I know there's a copy of every issue at the Chicago Maritime Museum, and I think it's my favorite maritime uh, magazine of any kind it was just absolutely incredible it was a combination of wooden boat magazine um i forget what the english one was called and then classic boat in england and there were contributors from all three countries that would and all over the world who would contribute to this particular periodical and as i was preparing 
uh, with Chris Castle to go to New Zealand the first time, I was reading a copy of Maritime Life and Traditions, and they were talking about, you know, New Zealand and Kiwis and sailing and Great Lakes scows. And it caught my attention. I started re reading deeper into it. And long story slightly shorter, if you go halfway around the world, go to Auckland, New Zealand, go to their National Maritime Museum, get on board their replica tall ship. It's a Great Lakes scow called the Ted Ashby. And what happened was um, back in around 1858, there was uh, a lumber baron named Mickle John who had uh, worked in the lumber trade in Canada. And he thought the Great Lakes scow would be the most incredible vessel for New Zealand because they were cheap and easy to build. They could get into all those undeveloped harbors. And uh, when I was sailing in Auckland Harbor uh, on the Ashby, one of the deckhands and I were talking and he said, yeah, it's great. You know, you got these boats, they, you know, flat bottoms, you ram them up on a beach and you let the tide take them off. And I was like, well, um, we don't have tides in the Great Lakes. He says, well, what the hell did you build them like that for? It was it. And, uh, but they were absolutely wonderful ones. Um, the lumber trade went on for a long, long time. Um, but after a while, there, as steamships were coming in and becoming more efficient, um, there, the, the ships turned into ships towing lumber rafts, uh, the tow barge system was uh, implemented, and um, there were a lot of overloading of vessels and very unsafe vessels. So if you had a couple of uh, work boats that were made to only last a few seasons, you could turn them into barges, and if the weather turned absolutely dicey, you could just cut them loose and let them go. So eventually, when the steamships took over, <coughs> later on diesels and the different combinations, that's what would happen to it. But there is a great old uh, tradition called uh, sea shanties. And it's, uh, it's kind of funny that uh, I do have a TikTok channel. You can see a couple of the sea shanties there. But uh, all of a sudden, after singing sea shanties for 35 years, they're popular now, just when we get a global pandemic to come in. But, uh, but I wanted to go over a little bit how sea shanties work and uh, it's kind of hard to do digitally, but basically a sea shanty is just basically a song to help people do work. And um, it's one of those things where um, you can say, uh, let's say like we're grabbing onto a halyard to pull up a sail. And um, let's say like a square rig topsail, something like that. It's heavy. Um, you can't just, uh, you know, hand over hand it like it's a, you know, like it's a jib or something. So what you do is the halyard goes uh, up and down through a couple turning blocks or onto whatever spar is holding the sail. And then you have uh, uh, the tail of that going through a turning block on deck and you line up a whole bunch of sailors who are all pulling at the same time. So if you want them all to pull at the same time, you can either say one, two, three, pull, you can say two, six, heave, or you can just teach them a song. And sea shanties uh, were mostly used for really big merchant ships. Uh, military ships, not much, if ever. Uh, merchant ships, for sure. And um, they're useful tools. And personally speaking, I've not done a guano boat around the horn, but I have taught I figured this out um, a couple of years ago. I think I've taught 7,000 kids on, on the schooners up in Traverse City alone um, how to set sail, how to weigh anchor, how to do things. And, um, and you put them to work because it feels good to do that hands-on stuff. So instead of getting them to pull, one, two, three, pull, I teach them a song. And the song I'm going to do is not a song that was necessarily in the Great Lakes. Um, Though there are examples, if you go to the Ivan Henry Walton collection, you'll see a list of songs, and it looks like the set list at an Irish concert. Um, 
you'll see uh, uh, all kinds of ballads from uh, Molly Malone and uh, Wild Colonial Boy and things like that. And those were just songs that sailors sang. They sang what was ever popular in the day. So in the day, in England, it was Charles Didbin. In America, it might have been Stephen Foster. And there were a lot of Stephen Foster songs that went to sea. These days, the, it could just be a pop song as well. My sweetheart uh, sailed on a couple different square riggers, and when she was on the Brig Niagara, and they were up aloft, furling the upper topsail, um, they would go out on the head and sing, do wa di 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 dum di di do And we all thought that was funny, but it really is exactly what sailors were doing in the 1800s. It's just updated songs. So what I want you to do is think about this song. It's called John Kanaka. comes from uh, Hawaii. And uh, the chorus is John Kanaka Naka to Lahie. Now stay muted, but sing anyway. I can see who's singing. Okay. John Kanaka Naka to Lahie. Now you would do it like this. John Kanaka Naka to Lahie. Or I've done it on... on um, on fish nets and trawling nets. John Kanaka Naka to Lahie. Or if you've got a lunch hook down, um, you know, a 90 pound Danforth or something on a small schooner, you might get a whole bunch of kids lined up and they do a stamp and go, which is you grab the anchor load, road, and then you walk it down the dock. John Kanaka Naka to Lahie. And there's a lead singer, the shanty man, and then there's everybody else who does the chorus, which saves everybody's breath. So call and response, call and response, do that. I'll sing just a couple verses. I thought I heard the old man say, John cannot cannot go to lie. Today, today is a holiday. John cannot cannot go to lie. To lie, ho, to lie, John Kanaka Naka to lie, we're outward bound at the break of day, John Kanaka Naka to lie, we're outward bound for Frisco Bay, John Kanaka Naka to lie, it's to lie, ho, to lie. John Kanaka Naka to Lahie. Oh, don't you hear the mister say? John Kanaka Naka to Lahie. Just one more pull, then be lay. John Kanaka Naka to Lahie. And the song stops, not at the end of the song, but whenever the mate says, high enough. So that's a sea shanty called John Kanaka. There's a bit of a story song that I got. And we're talking about the lumber trade. Um, this is mid 1800s. Um, it was just a piece of paper that fell out of a notebook on the Ivan Henry Walton collection. And um, as I was saying, Ted Karamansky uh, turned Chris and I onto that collection. We turned Lee Murdoch onto that collection. And there are I'm sure other people going through it right now. But I also found out that when I was at Mystic Seaport that there was a, a guy, um, oh, God, what's his name? Uh, he's a librarian out in Maine who's retired. Um, uh, anyway, he went through the collection in the 1970s. And he had a totally different view of it. And also Jonathan Eberhardt, um, from a book called uh, a group called the Boarding Party, uh, was into folk music. He went through the Ivan Henry Walton collection in the 1960s, and until very very recently, when everything got digitized, it was about six or seven big book file boxes, and um, a lot of index cards that were held together by rotting rubber bands and things like that. It was. Um, and, nine, and 78 RPM records that played from the inside out. So if you wanted to hear anything in the collection, you had to bring your own record player. So we were going through these different books and, and whatnot. A piece of paper fell out. 
on the floor. I picked it up. It was written in a definite dialect, a dialect of the Great Lakes, and uh, tells the story about a Great Lakes sailor in the lumber trade in the 1800s who um, found that discretion was the better part of valor. Yim Janssen shipped from lumber yard upon the scow Sam Patch. He didn't know his starboard bow from off the forward hatch. He made a big bluff before his sail that he'd been sailor man. But when the troubles when the trouble struck the scow, Yim had to show his hand. Now the scow been in the cordwood trade and she sailed from Sister's Bay. And Yim he would be handy man till off twin points one day. Then just like finger snap, a squall on the wood scow flew, and made her stand on her beam's end and call up all the crew. Now the captain swore like crazy man, and at him Janssen yell, Yump up and rift that topsail quick, or it gone to blown to hell. But Yim said, I not stir from this Cahootin stanchion. There been ten thousand topsails, ya, yeah, but only one Yim Janssen. And that's how Yim he lose his job, and go no more to sea. At sailing he been greenhorn sure, and always want to be. When he was kicked from off the ship, he heard the captain swore, but said I'd rather land this way than to float along the shore. <sighs> High seagoing drama, definitely. <laughs> We were talking about different things, too. Um, one of the great pleasures of being in the Maritime Society, the Maritime Museum, and uh, doing the Chicago Maritime Festival uh, for all those years um, was delving into some of the books, the people that you met, uh, The Ghost Ships of the Great Lakes by Dwight Boyer. There's a whole series of, of maritime books by um, Dwight Boyer. Speaking of um, shipwrecks, Chris Cole, Someone who came to the Chicago Maritime Festival many, many, many times. Um, Frederick Stonehouse, who you will see next month, I think, right? Do not miss Frederick Stonehouse. Trust me. Um, for those of you who don't know them, and I would imagine there aren't that many at this point, um, absolutely amazing. Um, also some people I met very, very early on, um, Walter and Mary Herthy, um, Schooner Days in Thor County. And, uh, of course, you know, a lot of these are at the museum. And I definitely got to put in a plug here for lumber hookers to the Hooligan Fleet, a treasury of Chicago maritime history. Uh, actually a contributor to. And uh, there's a whole chapter on sea shanties that go much more into that. But it's uh, this is a lot of fun. This was absolutely incredible. Um, I want to finish up with a song that we basically did to close up um, the Maritime Festival for many years. And, um, and it's, uh, it's a song that I knew uh, probably from Mystic Seaport, uh, Rolling Home. And it's usually, it's a homeward bound sea shanty that uh, people have used instrumental accompaniment for for a very very long time and there's a rolling home to old england rolling home to nova scotia rolling home to new caledonia meaning canada not the pacific um all kinds of different versions of this and i was really delighted to see in the ivan henry walton collection rolling home to old chicago and um it's really neat that basically we have this culture that's all around the Great Lakes, but also it's international. When I talk to people about sailing tall ships, I said, um, being a member of the crew of a tall ship gives you a backstage pass to every tall ship in the world. And it's one of those things where you, you go down to different tall ship festivals and whatnot, and you say, hey, I... I used to sail on the Pride of Baltimore, and you will be aboard with a beer in your hand and as soon as the festival closes. And uh, it also works for um, 
Also works for ferry boats crossing the Irish Sea. Um, also works for ferry boats in Mexico going to Cozumel. And um, it's an international language and a backstage pass. And it's the same if you're a diver, if you're uh, a maritime uh, aficionado, or just love the sea, salt water otherwise. So. When the maid calls up all hands, man the capstan walk around. Heave her up, lads, with a will, for we are homeward bound. Rolling home, rolling home, rolling home across the sea. the city of Detroit where the cinders fell on deck all the day and half the night rolling home that's your part rolling home rolling home across the sea rolling home to old Chicago rolling home near town to the Steer for old and late, and at last we we'll set the sail. Say goodbye to Buffalo Town, and we'll show the ship's old tale. Rolling home, rolling home, rolling home across the sea. Rolling home to old Chicago. Rolling home. St. Clair, Port Huron, we let go, and we'll hoist the canvas forward on the main and mizzen too. Rolling home, rolling home, rolling home across the sea, rolling home to old Chicago, rolling home near The straits are best to winter, far astern the Isle Pablo, and southward to Lake Michigan, to the town of Chicago. Rolling home, rolling home, rolling home across the sea, rolling home to old Chicago, rolling Chicago, rolling home near town to the Thanks for having me aboard. Thank you very much. If you want to do a and a or something after that. Sure. Uh, Still have Tom, a half a pint. <laughs> great. Thank you so much for coming, Tom. Um, we'll let others uh, pipe in when they have questions. A couple of people wrote questions to me in the private chat, but they were questions mm. for you. Uh, one of the questions was, was the Charlotte Ann your first tall ship that you worked aboard? Yeah, pretty much. Um, though at the same time, Rob Kunkel and Dave Pasquith uh, had Windily in, the, in Burnham Harbor as well. So that, mm -hmm. they, approximately the same time. Um, so maybe a, a hair later. Um, Let's see. Yeah, uh, Windley was a Chappelle design schooner uh, about 42 feet. And I think she's back in Puget Sound right now. Uh, but that was the first one, definitely. Very good. Uh, another question somebody asked me was, where can they find your music? And I told them a few places like Amazon Music and iTunes. So why don't you fill us in on where else? Yeah. <laughs> well, the nautical one I had, um, uh, Tommy's Gone to Hilo, is uh, pretty much out of print. Um, I did a couple of uh, online concerts for the Old Town School and a couple other places this last winter. 
and we recorded it at a um, a really nice studio here in Madison, and I had um, oh, I think four or five people singing and playing things, and I was going to use that to do another maritime album uh, for the Tall Ship Festivals that were going to happen last summer, and they all got canceled. So that will definitely be. I should have that out in June. Definitely a new maritime recording. And some of the other ones are available, like Amazon CD Baby and um, uh, on my website, too. Definitely. And speaking of your website, is that the best place to go to find your podcast? Yeah, there's a link to the podcast there. And uh, it's on. It's hosted on Buzz uh, Buzzsprout. But you can also get there by, uh, I think it's Clear Channel and iRadio and... Or whatever the name is um but it's it's a lot of fun we wanted to gather the story of the modern sailors and archive them um we're part of a group that's kind of standing by to help the Den schooner dennis sullivan uh because right now she hasn't sailed in two seasons uh in milwaukee and we're hoping um basically just to be advocates for the boat and to keep her sailing that's great Everyone's welcome to unmute themselves and ask oh, a question yeah. or type a question in chat if you want. Mm. Turn um, the chat on. Also, I definitely encourage everyone to go to tomcastle.com. Uh, you can hear some of his uh, music, see a couple of really interesting music videos that he's got on there. He's got a calendar. Check out the calendar to find out when his next late night program. Tell everybody about your late night program that you run. Yeah, that's on there. It's just called the Midnight Cocktail Concert. Uh, it started kind of when COVID started because all, a lot of my friends who are singer-songwriters and musicians were all doing Zoom concerts, usually Friday or Saturday at 7 or 8 o'clock. And we were all competing against each other, and it just seemed silly. One of the things I really love, as Jim knows, is the get-togethers after the concert. In fact, da Dahi and I uh, ended up at Rico Benny's after the last um, fundraiser. Um, totally unplanned. And thank you, and you ask for introducing me to some wonderful late night pizza in Chicago. That's great. <laughs> Very good. See, I just posted your website in the chat. Oh, thanks. And, Ted, uh, what's your favorite Great Lakes song? Um, boy, that's because it changes all the time. That's the thing that's about favorite songs. I would say one of the things about the Edmund Fitzgerald usually don't give kudos to, um, you know, a pop song. You're supposed to be very cool as a traditional, you know, singer and say, well, you know, it's it's really not as accurate as the Antelope or the Wreck of the whatever. But the Edmund Fitzgerald is just one hell of a great song. It is, um, it's extremely accurate. And name another song that is, I don't know, seven verses long. It has no chorus. And it is about people dying. I was having this conversation with a couple folkies uh, not too long ago. And they said, yeah, it's something about that song. People who are in their 20s right now uh, can sing every verse of it. Um, one musician I know said, yeah, I was playing at a wedding and the groom really wanted us to play the Edmund Fitzgerald. I was like, I don't know. <laughs> that says a lot, I think. <laughs> well, since Ted Karamatsky asked that last question, I'm gonna give a plug to his latest book. It's called Mastering the Inland Seas. I've always told everybody that Schooner Passage is required reading if you're involved with the Maritime Museum or the Underwater Archaeological Society, but Mastering the Inland Seas is now required reading as well. Ted, thanks for Ooh. writing it. It's a great book. I give great presentations on the topic over the years, and uh, we all really appreciate learning from you. Oh, big time. Yeah, as I said, I, I wouldn't have anything to do with Great Lakes Maritime anything unless, you know, I'd met Ted Karamansky, um, and you guys. It was a life changer. Um, it took away any chance I had of ever having a retirement. So, <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, 
but it's been yeah, it's been absolutely incredible and working with these different museums and um you know literally all over the world and that's one thing that um, is a lot of fun <clears throat> with the chicago maritime festival uh bill strauss recorded actually bob gadboy recorded all the um all the saturday evening concerts and if you go to youtube and just search Chicago Maritime Festival, you'll see 15, 16 years of, of concerts. And there are people from everywhere, from Hawaii and Belize to England, Ireland, Scotland, France, and all over the U.S. And um, it's an amazing international community that, you know, we're part of. We're the, we were once the fourth busiest sailing port in North America. So we've got, we have just as much you know, heritage as a Boston or a Salem or, or a New York. It's just, unfortunately, Chicago's forgotten a lot of that. That's why we need a museum. Well, you did a phenomenal job with those festivals, bringing in talent from all around the place. And, uh, uh, and the lectures. The lectures were something that I wish we had recorded more of. Uh, you know, the Ralph Fries lectures. Um and Ted and, um, and the guys from you ask doing all of those shipwreck, um, all those shipwreck lectures were phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. Um, and then we had, um, I forget his name, but he was down from the National Archives. And uh, probably Martin Tui. Yeah. And he was talking to people. And I just remember people that were just kind of, you know, vaguely interested. And then when he said, no, you, you just come down, actually call us a couple of days before and we'll do, we'll start your research for you and you can come down and check this stuff out. It was, it's really empowering, especially, uh, I mean, you could find almost anything on the internet, but there's something extra cool to me to go down to an archive and, you know, have the thing in your hand. It's amazing. Yeah, we're really fortunate to have a branch of the National Archives here. And in January of 2020, I started a huge new project with them. And in February 2020, they closed and they've not been opened again since because oh. of the pandemic. So, uh, so we're itching to get back in there and get rolling with stuff. But uh, yeah, it's a phenomenal resource. Martin Tui, who you brought up, he's over at the Pullman. Uh, I'm not sure the exact name of the national park there, the Pullman Historic <laughs> Site. So, oh, uh, okay. Yeah, he's a he's a great resource. And you mentioned Fred Stonehouse. He had to reschedule. Yeah, he can't make it next month because of I think it's called the Michigan 200 Dog Sled Race. He's got that weekend. He's not competing, but he's a <laughs> city councilman, and so he's got responsibilities with that. So Fred's going to be our December. Uh, third Friday speaker will be talking on the history of life-saving service of the Great Lakes. Yeah, he's, as an author, he's he's so diverse. Everything from, uh, uh, you know, very serious things like life-saving service all the way into ghost stories. And um, he is also, is he still the director of the Marquette Maritime Museum? I don't think he's a director. He's still very involved there. But uh, he's he's gotten so involved in city politics, so that really eats up a ton of his times. And he's ah. caused us to reschedule his presentation multiple times. Gotcha. We, started, we had him scheduled a year ago, and four or five times now we've rescheduled him. So hopefully it's actually going to happen in December. Oh, but, yeah. No, definitely. Yeah. It, do, do not miss Fred Stonehouse like ever. It's uh, it's always a lot of fun. I, also, he's just a great guy. And um We've had some good times at the Marquette Maritime Museum, and um, he was also, I think, at our fest as well. Um, yeah, just, you know, when you get a chance to tour around, get in your car again, um, all of these little maritime museums around the lakes are just absolutely fascinating. Yeah, for next month, I've been talking to Joel Stone. He's the he's now the curator emeritus of the Detroit Historical Society and the Detroit History Museum and the Dawson Maritime Museum. Oh, a few yeah. years ago, he wrote a book called Palace Steamers about the uh, early, really luxurious passenger steamers on the Great Lakes. So uh, we're probably going to have on that, although he's got a stipulation that he'll only do the program for us if we agree to have them in person as soon as we're able to as well. Uh... So, uh, so we'll be seeing some of 
Joel around here. Now that he's semi-retired there, he's got a little more free time. And he's been uh, president of the Association of Great Lakes Maritime History for a few years. And he just retired from that too. So he's uh, well-connected and well-loved around the lakes. And we're looking forward to getting to know him better here in Chicago. Well, I'll tell you, I have to say, you know, kudos to uh, to Jim and, and everybody at the Maritime Museum in Chicago for um, keeping this thing alive through pandemics and floods and everything else. It's just absolutely amazing. And I, I love the idea that we have a Maritime Museum that's on the water and interacting with the water soon. And that's just, it is just a wonderful thing, a dream come true. We're good. We got a great group of volunteers there. And Jerry Thomas is here. Jerry has been the hardest working person you could imagine for years at the museum. Um, he's he's done a lot of everything for the museum, and uh, we certainly appreciate that. Oh, big time, big time. Yeah, and it's nice to have, you know, people who are sailors who are also interested in the heritage. Um, it's and there's so many in Chicago. It's great. It's absolutely great. And uh, yeah, Jerry and uh, Don. Th that's one of the one of the regrets is I only knew Don, you know, tangentially from coming to stuff at the Maritime Museum. I never really got to know him well. And that's one of the, I think one of the um, one of the lessons learned is, you know, take advantage of the people you meet and. You know, if you think you want to hang out or have a have a drink or ask a question or whatever, don't just do it. Don't you know? Don't put that off. Most of it is just ask. When I'm doing these um, these interviews for Sullivan stories, it's amazing. I've done uh, I think I've done 13 of them right now, and one of the questions I ask is, "How did you get into sailing?" And most of the time, it's just absolute serendipity you happen to be the last interview i had i just posted um uh with uh, a guy named uh, christian um Eastlinghouse. um he's he got on board a square rigger in duluth because of the german speakers of minnesota club he's originally from germany and uh, he was he was in the united states and i think he was in the twin cities and he was in a small, like, internet group of German speakers in Minnesota, uh, simply because he was fluent in the language. They said that there was this German ship coming to Duluth called the Roald Amundsen, and um, they were looking for crew. So he went up there, and he met the people, and he had no sailing experience whatsoever, got on board a square rigger and sailed with them around the Great Lakes for a few weeks, and then because he now had experience, he ended up on the Dennis Sullivan for many years. He was on several other ships around the world. He was one of the main riggers of Peking when they took her to Germany from South Street Seaport. He hitchhiked around the world on sailing ships. And as I was talking to him a couple days ago, he was in Guadeloupe buying a 50-foot boat to sail around the world by himself. You know, And it's... And it all started because he said, hey, can I go sailing? And that's all it took. Your key to adventure. <laughs> Great. And, you know, along with Don, you're one of those people, too, that have a couple of beers with you, and you'll be amazed at the stories we'll hear that you never would have guessed. And, I, live, but, I live for like, the stories. That's definitely yeah. it. And everyone has them. That's the thing. Everyone has them. Mm -hmm. I saw your reaction at the beginning when I mentioned that Don Glazelle had grown up on Grant Wood's Artist Colony. Grant Wood's the guy who made American Gothic. And I know. <laughs> would imagine. And he he had tons of these little tidbits about his past that and until you talked to him for a long, long time and finally some reference would get made to it. Um, fascinating people out there. And fortunately, the museum attracts a lot of these fascinating people. So it's a great place to to get involved and get to know people. That is definitely something about museums anywhere is that they do attract interesting people. And um, one of the most interesting people I've met recently in the last decade is um, uh, a guy named Gaylord Campbell, who just happened to be my neighbor in that little cottage on the lake 
we rented for a while. And uh, his parents uh, were some of the people who discovered Coumadin. Um, his mother was um, still 97 years old and was still cross-country skiing in the yard in the winter. He had, um, um, let's see, he had, um, he had to leave the United States for political reasons in the 60s. He ended up in Paris um, living with Miss Sweden, ended up doing, um, bringing 400, uh, bringing water to 400 villages in West Africa. And, um, and uh, also uh, there's a film that's uh, called The Great Rescue of rescuing him off the north face of Grand Teton, the most technically difficult mountain rescue ever. And um, I could go into Gaylord Campbell stories for hours. And it's just somebody that serendipity brought to my doorstep literally because he was my neighbor. And the guy who lived in back of us um, was a retired oceanographer who did all the audio and sonar equipment for some of the early research vessels like Alvin at Woods Hole. And you never know who you're sitting next to. That's the, that's the thing that's interesting. Just be open to it and just start telling stories. It's great. Very good. You know, everyone else, you're welcome to unmute and join in the yeah. conversation. I'm talking way too much here. If we, if we want to keep Tom talking, if he's willing to <laughs> say, I, mean, I haven't even checked what time it is. It's uh, mm. 8.15. So oh, 8.15, it's early, yeah. We, I just wonder minutes. if Tom's running out of beer. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I just did. I got, I got water. It's okay. I can. And there's more upstairs. We're fine. We're fine. Very good. I mean, there's. We're talking about interesting people. I'm looking through the list of names of the people who are here. We've got Richard Lanyon, who's presented four times here before. We're thrilled to have him around. Uh, because he's somebody that we always learn a lot from. Uh, another talented singer, Dean Nolan, is here from the Underwater Archaeological Society. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, if you guys want to oh, jump, jump in and say hi or Colin ask a question. Richard, Philip. Ooh, um, lots of people. Also, I, I got a lot of private messages from people telling me that they had joined tonight or made a donation. Thank you all. For the support thank you tom for bringing in the people who are supporting the museum oh no definitely yeah and everybody please chip in a little bit or lots um become a volunteer yes most definitely most definitely yeah um you will enjoy that quite a bit um just hanging around with all those uh with the artifacts, it's, um, you know, um, hanging out with Bill Ballinger back in the day, you know, when he was doing the David Dow's model. I think that David, that's my favorite model in the world. That's, you know, there are, there are some phenomenal models and, uh, you know, I've seen the, like the Crabtree collection and the Chesapeake and, and all of those, but, but Ballinger in Chicago, that's, you know, that's always one of my favorites. Yeah, that and the Wolverine model he made at the museum, and they're just phenomenal. Yeah. I didn't realize he made the Wolverine. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I should have known that. Yeah. It was a great loss when he moved out. I don't know, was it the British Columbia or Seattle, somewhere Puget Sound, North Pacific area. Um, but uh, the last thing he did was the Wolverine. Oh, okay. The little human interest points he puts in his models too. You you're going to talk Wolverine. about the. You're going to talk about the cat, right? Or you get in the Wolverine? The cat and the David Dow, or the guy, the pilot oh, tossing his the cookies on the ship. Or the pilot tossing his cookies on the ship. Yep. I've seen. Ah! Hey, I'm an old carrier man myself. I've seen the pilot, uh, the rookie pilots come in shaking and tossing like anything. <laughs> he did have a sense of humor. 
isn't the cargo on the David Dow's from the David Dow's? It is. It's actually <clears throat> from a piece of coal that was brought up from the David Dow's and made into the little tiny pieces that are in there. <sighs> wow. I love that. Oh, I mentioned Crabtree. He was, um, um, let's see, what maritime museum was it? It's on the Chesapeake. Um, uh, it, it's a collection of model, not model ship. What is it? Modelers, help me out. There's, I'm new, saying the term Newport wrong. News? Yes, Newport Mariner's News? Museum, Mariner's yeah. Museum. And um, he did a, a whole series of ships from very, very early, like Phoenicians all the way into the 20th century. And when he was doing um, a rowing uh, galley, he had uh, one of the stories that um, I think it was Lauren Furry told me. Um, he was looking for a skin that would be scale to a cow. So he actually got a mouse and tanned the hide of the mouse to put on the drum of the galley. <laughs> and there's a there's a modern 20th century or late 19th century model there that is one of those models that you can't see the interior of at all. But when they were restoring it a few decades back, somebody put a you know fiber optic into it and inside the hold where no one will ever see is the accurate interior of the vessel. It is just, you know, and his wife you know, made every spike on, you know, grinding little brads down to, to, uh, to uh, planking nails and, uh, and spikes. And it was just so many stories they had. Um, just talking to any docent at any museum is usually fascinating. It's incredible because they, they're hanging around that museum sometimes for years, and they've collected all these stories just looking for somebody to ask them a question. <laughs> it is absolutely wonderful. Uh, Tom, I would add that it's not just the curators who have the good stories. I worked eight years at the Field Museum, mostly as a security guard. And <laughs> there's some stories, but I wouldn't share them now. Uh, next time we gather for a pint. <laughs> Sounds like the story of the Lincoln bed at the History Museum is not a story that should be told in public <laughs> about oh. what volunteers have done there in the evenings. <laughs> <laughs> not surprised. <laughs> not surprised. Oh. So what's happened with Ralph's canoes? That's what I want to know. Well, we're still taking care of them. Uh, one that had been, there was a old birch bark that had been refurbished and we're working on doing a really precise photogrammetry of it now. We're working with the folks from the Underwater Archaeological Society doing that. So we're gonna have a great digital 3D model of it. And no, I meant what the volunteers were doing oh. late at night, that's all. Oh, that, <laughs> as far as taking them out on Bubbly Creek? Or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, pretty safe bet we're not taking them out of Bubble Creek. Uh, <laughs> you know, there I'd is, there is actually a kayak rental right at the building now where people can rent and go paddling on the creek. Mm. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you won't see me out there. <laughs> but uh, hopefully we'll be able to encourage people to come paddling from downtown to that spot and come out and visit the museum and be great to develop some programs like that. Oh, definitely. Definitely. That'd be a ton of fun. We need to locate one of the films from uh, Ralph being interviewed on the uh, weather channel. And the weather guy turns to Ralph and said something about rain. And he says, uh, canoeists don't like rain, do they? And Ralph looked at him with that dumbest look he'd ever heard thing and said, what do you think we used to fill up those rivers with? Perfect, Ralph. <laughs> I, no, we'll tell that, well, I'll tell that one over a pint, definitely. Uh, 
There were so many Ralph stories. That was, um, God. Oh. Uh, yeah, getting to know Ralph and Rita, and uh, we were down in Florida, not last winter, but the winter before, and uh, Rita always says to send her best, and um, absolutely amazing. She's uh, teaching ceramics and enjoying the warm weather, but uh, she still misses Chicago quite a bit. Very good. Well, Jerry, I think we could probably stop the recording any time for the official program, but uh, oh. certainly encourage anyone who still wants to say hi to Tom or tell a story or ask a question to pipe in and join in the chat. Uh, Scott Reimer writes in the chat asking about your favorite beer. I think he missed your story at the very oh. beginning about your beer. 